Um, so we've been talking lately. You know, when I came in this morning, um, all the desks were arranged in a circle from a previous class, and I, uh, you know, we, we straightened them out with, with the help of some other early folks. Um, although I briefly considered putting them in the circle just because we've been sort of talking a lot lately. Um, there hasn't been a lot, I don't know if you noticed, there hasn't been a lot of, um, you know, specific examples to work through. Um, but, uh, and today's going to be a little bit like that also, although I would, um, I would like to encourage you to think, uh, think some, some deep thoughts along with me, and I would like to hear your opinions about this or that things. But for now, actually, there's a little bit of more technicality that I want to talk about. Um, we have been talking about languages that are either recursive or recursively enumerable. That's R-E. So the, um, the basic kind of hierarchy of languages here is there's the regular languages, which is like A to the N. Then there's the context freeze, which is like A to the N, B to the N. Then there's, so this category is called recursive. And this includes A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. <laughs> this would be languages which you can uh, compute on a Turing machine and that Turing machine is guaranteed to never have any infinite loops. Uh, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N is like that because our, our example of like a marking machine can do that language and that machine has no opportunity to, to make infinite loops. But there are some languages which you can do on Turing machines but they might um, have infinite loops involved in them. And the one that we talked about last time is this, what I called LH, that is the language of the halting problem. So this one here, you can do it on a Turing machine. But one way to, one way to say this in like very informally, um, the idea is you can do this on a Turing machine, but for certain inputs, this will have infinite loops and you'll never actually know what the answer was for those inputs. So you can do it on a Turing machine, but um, some inputs, can I say this very informally? If I was trying to like explain this to a kid, I might say, some inputs require infinite time which in terms of uh, real world machines, that's basically out of the question, right? So that's why this LH, um, we typically say it is uncomputable by a Turing machine. Now, it is technically computable by a Turing machine if you allow it to run forever, but you know, we don't in real life. So that, that's a language where you can do it on a Turing machine, but some inputs will make the machine run forever, all right? Which is bad, okay? Uh, what I would like to talk about for a few minutes is there actually is languages out there, even outside of the RE category. These would be languages which you just can't do on any Turing machine, whether you run it forever or not. Um, uh, I, and actually, it's not so hard to say what they are. I think within you know, 10 minutes, we can, we can describe an example of a language out here. So can I just remind us, LH, this is the language uh, which consists of all strings that look like that, such that M is a Turing machine which halts on X, all right? That's the language of the halting problem. You give it a string representation of a Turing machine and also some kind of input, and then the, uh, the language consists only of those machines and inputs where they halt, all right? Uh, this is not recursive. It's in this RE category, but not recursive and we explained why last time. Uh, I will say similarly, there's a, uh, a simple variation here. Um, I'm gonna call this one LU. This is the same idea, M hashtag X, such that, just instead of halts here, I'm gonna say accepts X, all right? These are very similar. You know, halt means either it accepts or rejects, but does not loop. The second one I'm talking about, just accepting, all right? And, and there's not much of a difference between these two. And by the same arguments from last time, you can show that LU is um, also RE, but not recursive. All right, and I will refresh your memory about sort of in, in ordinary terminology, what that means is I will say IE, um, we can verify on a Turing machine if some M accepts 
x, but you can't always say yes or no. Does some Turing machine M accept X or not? This is this is strange. It's a it's a very subtle difference. But when I say something is RE but not recursive, it means you can verify if the string is accepted. That's easy. Uh, you just simulate the Turing machine and see what happens. And if it's accepted, you can demonstrate yes, it is accepted. But if you don't know if it's accepted or not, you uh, cannot decide on a Turing machine if it's accepted or not because that may involve infinite loops and uh, if your Turing machine enters an infinite loop, it's not possible actually to know if it was an infinite loop or if it was just taking a long time. So that's the, uh, the moral of the story. We can verify if some machine accepts a string, but you can't say does it accept the, the string or not. So, a strange uh, and important subtle distinction, all right? Uh, anyway, I wanted to say an example of a language that's outside of all of those categories. It turns out LU bar, that is the complement of LU. That means all strings which either don't look like this at all or they look like this, but M does not accept X, which means either it rejects or it enters an infinite loop. All right, that is not RE. All right, so on my little diagram up there, that's out here, this thing. I'll call it LU bar. Actually, LH bar is also out there, although it's, it's less, uh, it's a little easier to talk about in terms of LU bar, all right? Um, can we explain why it's true? Actually, it's not so hard to see why it's true. So I'm gonna say, um, here's a little proof, I suppose. If we, uh, we're gonna argue by contradiction, so we are gonna assume that it is RE. Assume LU bar is RE. What that means is we can verify by a Turing machine if some x is in LU bar, right? That's what it would mean um, to be RE. You can verify. You can't tell yes or no necessarily, but you can um, verify that it is in the language, all right? Um, uh, bar, sorry, I meant to write bar, right? Uh, what, what that means, of course, means this is the same as we can verify by Turing machine if x is not in LU bar, uh, LU, right? That's what it means to be in LU bar, means it's not in LU, all right? We can verify by Turing machine if x is not in LU. So we can check for any x if x is not in LU. But I already said up here, where did I say? This business, we can verify it because LU is RE, that means we can verify if some M accepts L. So, but I will say since LU is RE, we can also check for any X if X is in LU, right? That's what RE, RE means. You can um, make a Turing machine to verify that something is in the language. You can't say yes or no, but you can verify it, all right? All right, but this, these two sort of underlined things, we can check if X is not in LU. We can also check if X is in LU. That means actually you can say yes or no, is it in LU. So combining those two things, so we actually can say yes or no if X is in LU or not. But this contradicts um, LU is 
R E, but not recursive. Because I just said a few minutes ago, recurve, recurve vice is what I wrote. I just said a minute ago, the whole point of L U being R E, but not recursive means you can say yes. You can say yes, it does accept, but you can't tell yes or no. Uh, but if you, if the complement, the, the idea is if the language and its complement are also um, RE, that means you really can say yes or no, which means it has to be recursive. And that's a contradiction. All right. So the conclusion is this LU is actually out here. There's no Turing machine at all which can, um, which can accept that language. Strange but true. Uh, also, LH bar is out there. Based, actually, there's a theorem. Any language in this category, its complement is automatically in this category for all the same reasons that I just said. All right. This is um, a non RE language. It does exist. All right. What I would like to um, uh, discuss today is kind of how uh, you should all feel about this. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to feel, but I will maybe I'll tell you a little bit about how I feel about all this. And I, um, my goal is not to convince you to feel a certain way about it, but just to allow you to think about this in a in a, um, in a in a way which encourages the feels. I have a lot of the feels about this. Am I using the phrase? I hear people say this, the feels. I'm all in my feels. Is that in my feelings? I don't know how to say it correctly and sound, uh, sound good when saying it. But um, there's some interesting feels associated with this, in my opinion. Uh, I will um, remember what we said last time. You can't decide the halting problem with the Turing machine. That means it's not possible to use a Turing machine to tell if a certain thing, um, a certain, for, ex for example, a Python program. You cannot make a computer that tells if a Python program is going to have an infinite loop or not. All right. Here's a little something you can do, some, some tricks that you can play with this. So remember that um, uh, it's impossible, um, impossible by a Turing machine is what I mean by impossible to tell if some Python program will halt, all right? <laughs> because if you, if you knew how to do that, then you'd be able to solve the halting problem, which is not possible to solve using a Turing machine, all right? It's impossible to tell if some Python program will halt. Um, people have realized that you can sort of translate this problem into a lot of other interesting scenarios and I have one example of that um, I would like to discuss um, this is actually I thought about this for a little while I believe this is my favorite number um, sometimes when I tell people I'm a mathematician they say oh well what's your favorite number um, and I don't have a really good answer to that question but this uh, actually this is my favorite number it would take me too long to explain it to the bros in the club if they asked me what's my favorite number. But um, this is called, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce this. I think this is a Russian's name. Um, Kaitin's number. This is called the halting probability. And it's written as a capital omega. Um, here's the definition of this number. Since you know about the halting problem, you can talk about this number. What I would like to do is um, I would like to consider a function which takes a number. So let's say like f of 5. Uh, you plug a natural number into it. And what this means, it's the um, number of legal Python programs of length 5. That means like literally the whole program only consists of five characters. There are not a lot of legal Python programs. Um, although you could just make it the whole thing a comment and that would be legal. So, I mean, there kind of are a lot, although not a lot of interesting ones. Anyway, this is the number of legal Python programs of length five, which halt, halt, sorry, I ran out of room there, divided by total number of programs 
of length 5. All right? So you can think of this, this is a fraction. It's like a rational number, right? And it represents, there's nothing special about 5 here, but this represents the proportion of Python programs of this particular length which actually halt versus the ones which, which uh, create an infinite loop, all right? So this is called, that's why it's called the halting probability. Sorry, I didn't write that correctly. Pro the halting probability, this is the proportion. So in general, f of n is the proportion of uh, programs of length n which halt, right? You just consider, say, like f of 100 means you consider all possible programs uh, where the code has length of 100 characters. And then you check all of them and see which ones halt and which ones don't. And then you figure out what, you know, what percentage of those actually halt. The answer, this number is probably very, very small. If you just consider generating Python programs at random, almost none of them are legal in the first place. Um, and then of the ones which actually do something, they probably don't create an infinite loop. They probably just don't do anything interesting. But anyway, that's, that's this. This is a number. For each n, it's a number. And it's close to 0, but not equal to 0, because some of them actually do do something um, and halt. All right? Um, and the interesting thing here is we can consider the limit as n goes to infinity of f of n. So what that means is you consider longer and longer possible programs, and you ask, as I consider like a really long program, what is the probability that it's going to halt? All right? That's a, that's a number that exists. This number, this limit exists. Actually, you can prove this using some real analysis, which I don't need to get into at the moment, but this sequence, fn makes a sequence, which is bounded because it's less than one because it's a, a percentage and it's also you can show that it's um, it's a decreasing sequence and so it does um, this limit does exist all right it equals a real number and this is called this is the definition of omega so what omega represents it this is generally speaking the probability probability that a random a randomly generated program will halt all right most randomly generated programs don't do anything at all but uh, some of them do and um, this is the probability that if it does do something then it will halt all right this is a real number it's between 0 and 1 but because it involves this halting business, no Turing machine can compute the digits. Digits of uh, this number. Does that sound interesting to anybody? Uh, this is a number for which no computer can say what it is. Uh, but we can prove mathematically that it exists. It is a real number, but its digits are uncomputable by any Turing machine. That is interesting to me. I don't know if that's interesting to you. Another thing that the bros in the club ask me sometimes when I say, um, I don't actually go to any clubs. Um, they ask, sometimes I say, like, you know, I'm a mathematician and I, you know, I, I teach and I also do research. And they're like, research? Math research? What is that? You like, you like discover new numbers or something? And I'm like, no, uh, we don't discover new numbers. Because my, my initial reaction is like, no, you idiot. Like, there's no such thing as new numbers. Like, everybody knows about all the numbers already. But actually, the bro is kind of onto something because there are certain numbers which actually you can never you can never say what their digits are. Like, there actually are numbers. This is called an uncomputable number. There actually are numbers which I can tell you what it is. I can tell you the definition of it. But you can't make a calculator that calculates it. Hmm? 
Does that sound interesting to you? I don't know. This sounds interesting to me, all right? And it makes me wonder things. Okay, you can't, so this is something that, we got 11 minutes left. We can, we can start feeling something at this point. No Turing machine can compute the digits of omega. I imagine if I actually explain this to somebody who doesn't know any better, I would say, hey, you know, did, did, did you know there's actually numbers? You can tell your friends. There's actually numbers that really exist, but, but you can never know uh, what the digits are. Um, your friends might say, what do you mean you can never know? And you say, okay, well, technically, you can never calculate them using a computer. And your friend might say, okay, but what about, what about me? Like, what about a person? Can I do it? Or is this a, because I'm saying no Turing machine can do it. What about a person? And um, now is when I start to feel certain things about, um, I mean, everybody needs to ask themselves the question, like, is my brain some kind of a Turing machine or is it something different? Um, and I would say, um, again, I'm not going to try and tell you how to feel about this, but I would say uh, a human brain, whatever it is, it's not, we don't really understand the, the precise mechanism by which the human brain works, but whatever it is, it is a physical object, and it somehow relies on memory storage and updating memory from one moment to the next or something like that. Uh, I feel like my brain must be something like a Turing machine. Um, because if you, if you really think a, a human brain is, is more capable than a Turing machine, because some people will say like, no, I'm not just a computer. Like I have, a, I have an eternal soul or something like that. Um, if you are more than a Turing machine, it means you have some kind of like magical halting oracle or something like that. And I don't want to disparage anyone who believes in an eternal soul, but do you believe that your brain has a halting oracle in it or something else like that? Like that, um, it's not clear to me that there's any grounds for such a belief. And I, uh, I don't want to, like I said, I really don't want to disparage this kind of attitude. I am a, um, I'm a person of faith myself, and so I, I am hesitant to regard myself as some kind of a, a, a soulless machine, right? Um, but at the same time, I would say, I mean, I, I, when I think about it enough, I, I kind of do believe that I am just a Turing machine. I wouldn't put the word just in there. I think that I am a Turing machine and I am, you know, a precious child of God. And the fact that I'm just a Turing machine and like I don't have a halting oracle, that's not, that doesn't make me less valuable as a, as a being in the universe, right? Um, it's a strange thing to think about. It makes me think about uh, something like, um, like, does God know the digits of the of this number? Um, I, you want, I, I want to say like, well, yeah, God knows everything, so yes. But at the same time, I would say God. I don't know. To me, God knows everything, sure, but God is not able to like violate. Um, logical principles that this is something that I have thought about over the years and maybe maybe you can disagree with me about this but uh, like I would say God can violate the laws of physics or something like if you believe in some kind of miracle that happened in the real world that's a violation of physics but violation of logic itself is a little uh, a little too much for me to handle I would say if God knows the digits of this number it's not because God computed them it's because he has an oracle for this number, or something like that. Uh, that the, the it mean like to me it means that um, I don't know. It means it means a, a lot to me. Um, this is something that uh, I would encourage you to wonder about. Does it um, the fact that there are uncomputable things like this is this good? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think uh, in the history of mathematics, this came as a surprise to people because most, most mathematicians throughout history, I think, have had some kind of baseline belief that all questions could eventually be answered with the proper analysis. And in particular, most people have a, have a gut instinct that any number, any actual number, could actually be computed. But uh, that's not true. Um, anybody have any feelings about this? Is this a good thing or not, that there are un uncomputable 
uh, things. I don't know, maybe it's a lot to take in, or maybe you're just not interested at all. That's, that's okay, I guess. It is, uh, it, to me, it is, um, it is an interesting and sort of a, a deep thing to think about late at night while looking at the stars or something. Any thoughts? So if you, let's say that, that God said, hey, by the way, here's this number that you didn't think was computable, <coughs> but here it is. Do you, okay. think that, do you think that that's purely because it's from an oracle, or do you think that there's principles that we don't know or understand to calculate these? Is it possible that there's things that we don't know, methods that we don't know to figure this out? Yeah. So if, um, this is a good question. Uh, I think my, um, and again, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to present my own opinions about these things as, as uh, you, you don't have to agree with me about all of this stuff, but I would say that when I say we can't compute this, it means no Turing machine can compute this. And so you might ask, well, maybe it's possible that people could build some machine which actually is more powerful than a Turing machine. Um, that, I would say, requires some kind of oracles which are not... Um, not like possible to do in the real world. Although it has happened in the history of computing that um, uh, you've probably heard of quantum computers and in, you know, towards the beginning of the 20th century we realized that the laws of physics were not what we thought they were and there's this stuff called quantum mechanics and people um, in the following decades realized, hey actually since the laws of physics are different from what we thought they were, we can use these weird new physical laws to create weird new computers. And so the existence of a quantum computer, um, it does things that we used to say were just impossible to do physically. Uh, it turns out uh, you could imagine instead of a Turing machine, some kind of quantum Turing machine that is allowed to do weird quantum things. Um, it turns out you can prove like mathematically the weird quantum stuff that a quantum computer does doesn't actually make it more powerful than a standard Turing machine. It's a matter of efficiency, but it doesn't make it theoretically more powerful. So um, I would say it is possible that the laws of physics are not what we think they are in a way which could allow us to create some other technology that maybe is better than a Turing machine. But uh, I'm not holding my breath about that. I don't know. Yeah. Aren't there also like proofs that we've said like if you can prove that you can't do it? Yeah, right. So like would that also be something that Yeah, there are you may have heard in, in other math classes that um, there are so this is an example of a of a mathematical object which cannot be computed even though we know that it exists. There are also examples of theorems which have been proved to be unprovable. That is the theorem, um, you can prove that you, that you could never prove this other theorem. Uh, those are called undecidable theorems. And I think there are, there are similar questions that arise. One, one of these theorems is called the continuum hypothesis and there's a famous, um, a famous mathematician uh, from the 20th century, Paul Erdos, he liked to say as a joke, um, because he knew the continuum hypothesis is unsolvable, he liked to say, when I die and go to heaven, my first question of God is, is the continuous hi continuum hypothesis true? Because this is something that just like, you might say human beings just are not allowed to possess that information. Um, although from another point of view, you could just say there, is, there are certain questions which don't have an answer. It's, it's not like there is an answer, but we can't know it. You might, that's equivalent to just saying there is no answer. But um, I would say, you know, my, um, my instinctive reaction to all of this is, is, a bit of a, is a bit of disappointment that what this means is there are certain things which are like permanently unknowable to people. Um, I don't know how, how you feel about that, but that's, that's just a true fact. There are certain things which we cannot know. And, uh, um, uh, to me, there's some, there's some comfort in that. You know, I feel like there's a certain attitude, uh, or at least like in, in pop culture, this kind of view of a mathematician is somebody who approaches everything in their life by logical analysis. And 
I, I, like I as a mathematician, I can only understand things if I can analyze them and prove yes or no, and like I see everything as some kind of binary, uh, everything is, um, you know, one way or another. That actually is not how mathematicians see the world at all. I think, I'm, I'm sure some of them do, but, um, you know, I actually, it gives me great comfort to know that there are some things that are not knowable by logical analysis. Like that to me is, um, I don't know if you feel good about that. I, I do feel good about that. Uh, because I know that actually the things in my life that are most important to me are not like logical abstractions. They are like my kids and my wife, you know, like the people who love me and I love them. Like that's, this is not something which, um, which I analyze as a logical abstraction. It's, it's like my real life. Um, and to, to me, it is kind of inspiring to know that actually logical analysis is kind of like my li like real life in that there are some things which you just can't know for sure and that's that's just how it is even in mathematics all right that's the end of our time for today um we do have a little bit more stuff to uh talk about next week but uh i think that'll do for